In smaller populations, the effects of evolutionary mechanisms are more profound than would be found in larger populations. Smaller populations are more prone to the effects of contingent conditions of local selection on phenotypes. These can cause allele frequencies to diverge substantially from what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium would predict. When we talk about contingencies, we are referring to unpredictable historical events that change the steady state of generational evolutionary change. Consider abiotic examples like short-term droughts, El Nino years, or biotic examples such as blights or other spillover diseases, or even extraterrestrial bolide impacts. More on that in another week. In his book, Wonderful Life, Stephen Jay Gould mused on the record of life as not being like a recording that was repeatable. Start again from the same initial conditions, and those unpredictable events would have a great effect on the overall pattern of evolution. He wrote, Replay the tape a million times, and I doubt that anything like Homo sapiens would ever evolve again. So, Gould placed a lot of weight on these contingent effects on the history of life, and we see their results, like the results of selection, most acutely in small populations. The Wright-Fisher model is analogous to the Hardy-Weinberg model for smaller populations, that is, populations that Hardy-Weinberg would consider smaller than infinite but it carries the same assumptions about selection, random mating, no mutation, and no migration. The calculations of the size of the gene pool are generated quantitatively from the size of the population. This model is most appropriate in its basic form for hermaphroditic species, so commonly for plants, but tweaks in the algorithm can account for species with separate sexes. Genetic drift is the random fluctuation of gene frequencies, meaning that the changes are selectively neutral. Many traits can change over time with little overall effect on fitness. Consider eye coloration among human populations. More than half the people worldwide have brown eyes, but blue or green or other colors of the iris are not substantially worse in vision. So I would argue that they could be considered to be selectively neutral. Genetic drift tends to decrease the observed heterozygosity in a population. For a typical gene with two alleles, one allele can become fixed while the other is lost from the population. The only way for a lost allele is to be regenerated would be through mutation of that remaining allele. If the number of heterozygotes tends to decrease within small populations, then when we compare small populations of a whole species, we see that the populations tend to be divergent in phenotype for that gene. Some populations with only the dominant phenotype and others with only the recessive phenotype. The effects of genetic drift are more noticeable in smaller populations than larger ones. What is considered small can depend on the kind of organism, how equal the sex ratio is, and if it has re recently suffered a bottleneck, which is a short-term drop in population size. Bottlenecks and founder effects represent similar contingent population conditions, one where the genetic diversity of the population is decreased through a drastically decreased effective population size. To quantify our expectations, we would need to calculate what is called the effective population size, the ones actively contributing to the gene pool. It's been found for many species that the effective population size can be nearly as small as a tenth of the census population. Usually the phylogenies that we look at are species trees. However, we can extend that kind of thinking to the level of the individual gene copy as well. Coalescent theory is the process of tracing back the common ancestors of alleles in one generation back to the individual that they came from in an earlier generation. In every generation, some genes manage to get themselves copied and passed down, but others are lost by not getting propagated. We are looking for that coalescent point, the common ancestor of those descendant genes. Mutations appear on gene trees the way the synapomorphies appear on species trees. Those mutations can be selected for or not. There is neutral drift when mutations replace the ancestral allele through random replacement rather than by selection. Positive selection preferentially chooses the mutant allele and tends to drive it to fixation quickly. Negative selection does the opposite by preferentially choosing the ancestral allele. Balancing selection tends to cause both alleles to persist in a balanced polymorphism. 
The 1960s saw the initial slow and expensive forays into gene and protein sequencing, and with those new data, biologists got a better idea about selection and mutation at the level of genes and proteins. It turned out that molecular variation was quite ubiquitous, far outpacing observable phenotypic variation. Natural selection alone could not account for this whole story here. In 1968, Mutu Kimura developed the neutral theory of molecular evolution to explain the high degree of molecular variation without phenotypic variation or natural selection. His theory proposes that at the level of DNA sequence or at the level of amino acid sequence of proteins, most of the variation in a population is selectively neutral, and that most of the changes in molecular sequences between species are also selectively neutral. In this discussion, there are a few terms that it's important to have straight. Um, some of these will be familiar. First of all, codon degeneracy refers to the fact that some mRNA sequences code for the same amino acid. In some cases, two to six different mRNA sequences can count for the same protein. Substitutions occur when a new allele arises and becomes fixed in the population. Synonymous mutations result in no phenotypic change, at least as far as the polypeptide sequence is concerned. On the other hand, non-synonymous mutations are ones in which the DNA changes and the resultant polypeptide changes as well. Non-coding DNA is present in the genomes of eukaryotes and duplicated and passed on, but doesn't code for protein. Pseudogenes are genes that have mutated into non-functionality, often by the insertion of a stop codon early in the sequence. Gene duplication is just that, the insertion of another copy of a gene. However, this forms the basis for gene recruitment and the evolution of novel but related phenotypes. And last, effective neutrality is the condition in which the selective coefficient is low enough that a mutation doesn't make a significant difference for a population that's small enough. Overall, Positive selection is a really powerful force in evolution, but the neutral theory is still a useful tool as a null model against which scientists can test for selection and other evolutionary processes. The last part in this chapter is to consider the molecular clock model. Over evolutionary time, genes of a given type, like nuclear genes, chloroplast or ribosomal DNA, amino acid sequence of proteins, should mutate at an approximately similar rate. This means that all the taxa on a tree should be approximately the same genetic distance from the outgroup of the tree. Working backwards, this has been used to assign times of divergence to taxa from HIV to pairs of mammals. This, in my opinion, has been overdone a little bit, and I think that it should be calibrated with the fossil record, but it is a compelling way for us to be able to use DNA information to reconstruct the timing of the branching of the tree of life.